Hello, learners from around the world, and welcome to the second episode of All You Can Learn, the web series by EIT Food that will take you on a learning journey in food, food innovation, and sustainability. I'm John Paul Judson, delighted to be your host today as we explore the course on sustainable seafood, barriers and opportunities in the fishing industry. This course has been produced by Food Unfolded in collaboration with experts from the Scottish Association for Marine Science and contributors from Fish Club and Hakai Magazine. You were over 200 to register for this session to find out more about this online course on a very special day to be talking about seafood, as today is World Ocean Day. And that is why in our welcome poll, icebreaker poll, we asked you to tell us which is the nearest sea or ocean to where you are right now. And I see that the North Sea is standing proud in the center of this word cloud. There's the Atlantic as well, but I'm sure many of you will be joining from, from around the world. So please give us a sense of which are the seas and which are the oceans around you. It's a nice way of being able to locate oneself, right? Um, but in addition to the topic and the presentation of the course, today is also an opportunity to reflect about the value of learning and online courses. And we can see the split in the audience between those who have already taken online courses and those who have not. Hopefully today, we will convince the 27% to take the jump and, of course, the 73% to pursue the when it comes to the online courses provided food, we see that close to 40% have already taken part in an EIT food online course. So it means that for more than half of you, this may be the first time you interact with EIT food and its various options for e-learning. In terms of housekeeping, we'll be together for the next hour and a half on the event platform. We start with an interactive presentation of the EIT food course on sustainable seafood, meaning that you can raise your questions in the Q&A tab to the right of the live stream. And of course, feel free to tap on gay party. At the end of the interactive presentation, you will then be able to use the remaining form by visiting the expo booths. You'll see the expo tab on this side of the, of the hop-in. And here you'll be able to find information and documentation on the course and more general information on IT food learning services. If we're not able to answer all your questions during this session, we will make sure up by email afterwards. Okay. If, if you don't get question now, it will still get answered and we will commit to that. So if you're ready, let's get started. And I would like to invite Oliver Fredrickson to join me on stage. Oliver is an editor at Food Unfolded. He focuses on marine resources. He has a background in marine science and aquaculture, and he was actively involved in the creation of the course, Sustainable Seafood, Barriers and Opportunities in the Fishing Industry. Oliver, welcome. I challenged you in the run-up to this session to describe the course, or at least to try and describe the course by using three foods. Okay, and you came back to me and you said, well, the first food is algae. Can you tell us why you chose algae? Algae was probably, I think, the, uh, the easiest one and probably the quickest one, I think, that came to mind immediately. Uh, and there are a few good reasons. I think one of the, one of the key um, things that drew algae to mind here was that it really, I think it challenges you. And it's one of those kind of foods that a lot of us don't even maybe you recognize as a food it pushes your boundaries um i'm not sure if any of you have eaten uh sort of like algae infused pasta there's plenty of sort of interesting amalgamations of algae out there or even just seaweed i mean seaweed in itself so super super rich and i hope this course is also super rich um for you guys who take it it's also super fast so i think uh relating to this course algae is sort of one of the one of the fastest growing um, one of the fastest growing organisms uh, in the ocean, right? It grows a lot quicker than any uh, land-based land plants, and it doesn't cost anything, which is also similar to this cause. It doesn't require any inputs to grow that even in a farm. You just kind of let it 
flourish naturally off what's in the in the environment around it. So I thought a good a good start and a fitting kind of um, lineage to this course. Okay, brilliant. That was algae. Then you came up with a second one, which I found quite surprising. <laughs> potato. Can you tell us why? Potato? Yeah, this <laughs> this one probably requires a little bit of explanation. I just didn't want to keep it too bland and go all with seafood. I know it's World Ocean Day, but I thought I'd kind of take it a little bit left field. So I think one of the uh, one of the key reasons here is that I think potatoes are sort of They've sort of often served this uh, utilitarian kind of functional role. I think for us as a food in general, they've kind of got us through wars and famines and through plenty of sort of hard hard times as a bit of a safety net. They're not the the kind of the, the, the sexiest food out there, but I think they're very functional. And I think just like this course um, and, the, and the kind of like basis of knowledge that it will present to you, uh, it's that there's some of these foundational keys to pulling the ocean out of a very tricky spot that it's kind of currently in, um, I think can't come from just basic knowledge. Um, and this course is sort of only a, only a humble beginning, I think, to understanding all those complexities, but the advice and the tools that it offers um, should help to play, uh, to play a bit of a role in giving you a better understanding so you can sort of support the oceans in their, in their hard time, I guess. So the knowledge is sort of the, the potato, drawing a bit of a loose string there, but. <laughs> I love it, I love it. And the, the third one was mussels or any kind of shellfish. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, any, any kind of shellfish, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it back. I'll say mussels, I think maybe mussels is, is, is the best choice here and there's a very good reason I think so I, at least at Food Unfolded when we uh, when we publish any sort of story around seafood I think one of the most consistent pieces of feedback that we uh, that we keep finding is that seafood is just confusing and that's just in a general sense on uh, on across all levels you know people are wondering what species do I consume or what do I choose what do these eco labels mean on the side of the can of fish uh, or even with this uh, recent documentary, that Netflix documentary, a lot of people were wondering, is it true? You know, are the oceans going to be empty by 2048, like uh, Sea Spirits, I think it was called, suggested, I think. And I don't really blame us. I mean, I think the industry's done a pretty good job of making it difficult to, to really understand um, and make sense of it all. And that's made it tough for us to, to lend our support to worthy causes or to do the right thing. Uh, and I think the humble muscle, which is a, is a fantastic choice if you're going to choose seafood uh, fits the bill for a number of a number of reasons I think this the first and most obvious to me is that they're super dense in nutrients so they're actually an amazing nutrient source um, and I hope this course just like the algae is, is kind of full of good information that's small but it's full um, they're also most importantly I think they're incredible purifiers so they purify the water around them they take uh, nutrients and they can turn sort of silty water into pretty clean water and actually used as a means to to clean polluted waterways in different parts of the world um, and i'm really hoping this course can kind of act like that for you it can kind of take some of that confusion that you have um, and it can and it can clarify those thoughts for you so you leave here um, not only kind of knowing about the issues but also the solutions that are out there and what you what you should actually Kind of be doing at least kind of nudge you in the right direction so you feel like you're a bit more sure-footed with your seafood choices sounds interesting and now that i think about it uh, in belgium where i'm based uh, they would associate very much mussels and potato actually as well come to think of it so uh, that's an interesting start um, we have algae we have potato and we have mussels as characteristics of this course but I would like now to ask you, can you give us a bit of an overview actually of what is the content within this course so that the audience can understand a little bit what to expect? Yeah, so I mean, if you want to go through the kind of content of what to expect in this course, um, essentially we kind of start with the, with the foundation of, uh, well, it's, yeah, essentially kind of everything around the fisheries basics and that can give you everything from like a broad range of topics um, to give you all the context you need to understand sort of how our seafood supply chains work um, who is producing the seafood and where how we manage our fisheries um, uh, how the state of fisheries and aquaculture has kind of evolved and changed over time as our demands have changed over time um, and where it kind of looks to be heading in the future so you'll get the basics all wrapped up in this course you'll also then move on to kind of the second sector which is more about 
the barriers that stand in the way of sustainable fisheries, um, which is sort of covering it. I mean, there's a broad range of topics in there, but kind of covering things like illegal fisheries, poor practice, things like seafood fraud. Um, and yeah, generally what's kind of holding our fisheries and aquaculture back from becoming more sustainable. I think that's kind of one of the biggest things that we'd like to, to show you and to provide you some nuance around those kind of topics. Uh, and then we also provide a whole host of uh, issues, hopefully, or, or promising kind of solutions to those issues. Um, sorry, not this yeah, the solutions there. Uh, so we provide you a long list of the kind of solutions that you could expect to see in the future, some interesting technologies, uh, right back to some sort of indigenous practices that are still hugely relevant today um, as to how to manage marine spaces and marine resources and how that could potentially weave into our future in, in, in fisheries. Um, yeah, but my, I think most importantly, you'll, you, you'll leave with a, a general better understanding of how you can kind of personally help to improve the sustainability of our seafood supply chains as just, as just one person with your choices. Um, so you'll leave with some kind of tools as well. Okay, brilliant. And um, can, you, can you give us a sense then, why would you say um, this course is important? Because maybe seafood is not the first thing that people think about when they, when they consider, you know, courses in, in food or food innovation. Can you tell us why this is important? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I, I totally understand that thought. Um, I think for a lot of us, especially people that live maybe further inland, I think seafood is definitely not going to be the first thing on your mind when you think about sustainability or food systems or even taking a course in general. But um, seafood is uh, uh, is a daily source of nutrition for about 3 billion people on the planet today and about one in 10, give or take, um, last statistics at least, were, were kind of uh, supported in their livelihoods with, with uh, seafood. So it's uh, inherently kind of intertwined with, with our global food systems in general. Uh, and our demand keeps rising. So even though the population's going up, our demand's also going up and it's forecasted to go up probably by another 15 or, or so percent by 2030. And uh, this kind of compounding demand as we've grown and as we uh, kind of ask more of, of, of our oceans to provide, we've ha of course intensified, ju intensified just as we've done on the land in our exploitation. And that's uh, the evidence of the impacts of that are kind of showing. I mean, I think we kind of, we did a lot of what we did in the oceans um, and even in, in all waterways, I think, without fully understanding the effects that it would really have on our oceans and even, even us as people as a whole. Uh, and I think we've kind of pushed things maybe a little bit too far. We've seen that in a number of instances over the past decades. And actually since the 19, roughly the 1990s, I think the wild fisheries have sort of plateau and they've reached a kind of limit as to what they can sustainably provide for us. And aquaculture or fish farming has had to take up the kind of lion's share of all of that growth and demand since then and is now basically providing about 50% of the seafood we see. So we've, we've kind of pushed our oceans to this um, point of inflection here and we don't really have the excuse, I think, anymore of not knowing um, what our impacts are. We do know this and I think if we want to kind of move forward, uh, collectively, even if you're not directly involved with seafood, I think we need to know sort of where we stand and we need to acknowledge our situation and start making those necessary changes um, that can potentially relieve some of that pressure as we keep growing um, on communities and suppliers and I think also just the oceans in general. Um, and I think this course specifically is, is, is important as it will not only kind of get you up to speed on all of those all of those kind of states of affairs, but will also give you some take home tools and the, and the necessary information to help you make sense of it for yourself uh, in your personal context, in your day to day life. So it should it should be applicable to to you, not just to to people in general. And so when you say applicable to you, uh, are you talking about us as as consumers? So to make more informed decisions or rather in terms of maybe shaping uh, decisions uh, further upstream uh, in, you know, in the whole way the seafood is actually being produced or, or you know, discarded from the ocean? Um, well, I think those things are kind of tied together. Um, I think there are kind of two sides maybe there. So I think you can have an impact as a consumer, absolutely, but you can also potentially have more of an impact um, 
as a sort of an active citizen, I suppose. So if you you can understand this system better, you know where to lend your attention, I suppose. And maybe it's not necessarily that for you, the best thing to do is to only be making the right choices. Maybe it's better for you to be speaking up to certain people or to be uh, asking your asking your fishmonger at the seafood counter where the fish is coming from so it puts some pressure on from that side of things and i think you need to have the knowledge of where where your kind of weight is going to be um, providing the most leverage and i think we'll give you the, the information to be able to do that and it will follow through i think throughout the supply chain i think uh it, at least in the recent decades i think there's been a lot of pressure um from consumers and it's had a lot of impact i think there's been a lot of new sort of markets that have opened up in the sustainability space around seafood and that's largely driven by demand i think for people who are who are asking for it and so is, is that for you uh, one one of the objectives then of this course to, to really get people on board to make much more informed decisions to question uh, where where products are coming from would there be other, any other kind of objective that you would outline for for this course that you would really be happy if people started to do certain types of actions following uh, after having followed the course yeah i mean i think as with any learning course, I think you're going to take it, you're going to use it as it fits to your life. I think we're all different and we, we all have kind of, uh, we're all going to have different uses for these things. But I think in, in a general sense, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be very widely applicable to you. I don't think that it's um, just going to be specific to like giving one person one tool. I think you're going to end up with a whole host of uh, tools. But yeah, the general, the general objectives are to just give you a better understanding of the seafood industry as a whole. Um, and we won't just dump kind of a ton of unnecessary information on you um, and all we expect you to become extremely proficient on sustainability in seafood. Um, but you will definitely, the objective at least is to definitely give you a, uh, a really solid understanding of the main challenges um, that stand in the way of sustainability and the main solutions and how you kind of fit into that puzzle. Um, and we also really hope that this doesn't sort of read like a textbook. That's one of our goals at Food Unfolded. Um, and I know a lot of future learning courses are kind of geared towards this as well, but it's it's not to kind of silo science in with other scientists. It's to make sure that that science is also presentable and approachable to everybody else. Um, so we've really made a, a good, a solid effort here, I think, to provide a really wide range of perspectives, which I think is uh, is very useful and valuable. And um, it's all very accessible and approachable for anyone, regardless of your prior knowledge on the topic. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's important, especially considering that indeed, maybe there would be many people who don't necessarily have a lot of prior knowledge. Uh, so you are providing a general knowledge platform here, but coming from people who have you know, worked in the field and understand very much um, the, the science behind it. Um, as a learner, you mentioned some of the tools that you that you think we, we could get out of out of such a course. But can you can you just give us the, the, the top line tools that we would be getting out of, of such a course? Yeah, so if you want the absolute kind of top lines, it would be um, basically, okay, so if we, if we want to look at it kind of how you could personally improve the sustainability of our seafood supply chains through the course, um, we'll essentially be giving you some information, say, on sustainability, on uh, sustainability seafood labels, which ones to look out for, which ones are maybe uh, not worth your investment, how to kind of make sense of the side of a package, which species might be worth favouring or not favouring. Um, you'll come out with information about fishing practices. You'll under, be able to understand which questions are sort of the right questions to be asking if you're looking to support more sustainable uh, practices, uh, which should be avoided, of course, in that line too. Um, which types of producers even, or even some potential companies that are worth your support and some that are not, and we're not sponsored by anyone, of course. This is just, uh, this is all objective. Um, and uh, there's a ton. There's a ton of other useful tools that you're going to get out of this, but they're the kind of they're the kind of broad stroke tools. Aside from all of the knowledge that you can take and use uh, alongside those tools, um, they're the kind of broad strokes I would say. Okay, brilliant. And uh, please uh, 
put in your questions, that you have the Q&A tab, which will make it easy to really spot your questions in the, uh, to the right of the live stream. You also have the chat where you can engage with, with other participants. And I see that uh, people are continuing to, to tell us where they're coming from. I hear, I see Lynn from Belgium. I see Joe from Warwick in the UK, some from the Mediterranean Sea as well. So welcome to all of you and put your questions in. We have a first question um, from Lynn on what is the most impressive innovative technology you've seen in the aquaculture that promotes sustainability? Oh, that's a tough question. The most impressive. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit biased here because I'm currently living in Norway and we are kind of in, uh, this is sort of salmon land. So I'm, I'm a little bit geared toward, towards salmon innovation. I know there are a ton of other amazing innovations um, in a lot of other parts of the world, but I'll speak for what I know best and what I've been around in the last kind of few years here at least, I think for me, one of the most, um, one of the most impressive innovations would probably be this sort of, I think also because it's a little bit novel, it's this giant egg sort of looking thing. So if you imagine a, a net pen, one of the farms that they actually grow fish in out in the, uh, out in the fjords here or out in the ocean in different parts of the world, um, they basically one of the, the main kind of issues uh, is that, they're, tr they're obviously in contact with the natural environment around them at all times. And that means they'll be getting parasites and they'll also potentially be passing those parasites onto other fish. And to combat this, this company has created this sort of encapsulated egg that sits submerged below the surface um, that can basically cut off fish entirely from the exterior while also pumping in a very specific way to, uh, to allow the right circulation and to not um, and to allow the light, the light to kind of come in in the right sort of manner. So it's, I, I think that's a pretty impressive thing to make work at scale. And it seems like it's actually potentially going to be um, potentially going to be drawing quite a lot of investment soon. So I hear at least. But uh, yeah, that's pretty exciting for me. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, the most impressive will be a little bit subjective. Um, <laughs> but there's another question that is intended to be a little bit more objective. Um, from Ed, how can we ensure that seafood production is truly sustainable rather than just using sustainability <laughs> as a marketing buzzword? And I think there probably the course will also very likely help because you, you will be getting a sense of what are the main criteria that allow for seafood production to be more sustainable. But can you already have a, have a try at answering that one? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think if you want to kind of go deeper on that, the course is probably the best place there. Of course, you can do your own research too, but we do cover all that kind of stuff in the course. Um, short answer, I would say, it's very hard to know uh, about the true sustainability of your seafood. Um, the reality is that sustain the word sustainability in itself is inherently used as a buzzword throughout the food industry, throughout almost every industry these days, I think. And seafood is one of those ones that is... I think the grey space that surrounds it and uh, the kind of vagaries around labelling make it particularly right for people to take advantage there um, from a marketing perspective. So it's very difficult, but I would say uh, basically as, as many people as you can cut out of the supply chain is probably the best way you can get to knowing that your food is coming from where you know it's coming from. Um, it's uh, traceability and transparency is sort of, sort of the number one, I would say, that a lot of people talk about as being the the best way to ensure that you know at least what you're getting is is truly what you're getting. And if you don't have answers or the people that you're talking to don't have answers to those kind of, kind of questions, then maybe that's worth uh, thinking twice. And does that necessarily then link up with the notion of local or not necessarily? It definitely does. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. I mean, local doesn't inherently mean sustainable. I think there's a maybe a little bit of a misconception there that just because it's going to be local, it's going to be sustainable. Of course, you can fish horridly, uh, but do it locally. Um, but for the most part, at least you are having that understanding of uh, if you do cut those kind of middle people out of the out of the supply chain, and you're going direct to a source. So if you have access to that, if you're near the coast and you have some small scale fisheries near you and they can offer you kind of a direct trade service, I think that's a great way because you actually understand, uh, well, you talk to the people that you're buying your, your seafood off. And I think that's the best way to really understand uh, how they're catching those fish. Um, and then you can take that 
knowing where they've caught this fish and the fish that you're catch and the fish that you're actually buying. Um, and you can even then add on a layer of doing a little bit of your own research to know what is the kind of um, health, the relative health of that particular fish in this particular era. You can probably find that information online, but you have to first know that it is actually caught in that area using that technique. Um, so I think that's probably why local is usually kind of bound up with sustainability and it's, it's, it is for good reason. And uh, link, link to this, uh, another question, and maybe you can highlight whether one can get access to something like this in the course. Um, do you have a, a definition or a diagram or some kind of visualization, I would imagine, for sustainable seafood? I don't know, it's a bit of a tricky question, that one. Uh, I don't know if I've got a visualization, but for me, I think, as I just said, like transparency is sort of the key and it kind of underpins everything, I think, in in seafood supply chains. I think if you don't have transparency, it's very, very hard uh, to define sustainability within seafood. Um, and I think that's why seafood labels are becoming so important as long as they're kind of validated in the third party. I think seafood labels, if they're if they're solid, can be a really good option for you to kind of cut out a lot of the guesswork and, and actually know that that is a generally sustainable product. But no, I don't think I have a kind of a clear understanding of exactly what I would call sustainability there. I think, I think as you'll find in the course, I think a lot of this, uh, I think that's a good reason. There's a lot of nuance around these kind of things. And I think there's no sort of, there is no sort of one answer. At least I don't think anybody's truly figured those things out yet. It's sort of a process. A more direct question or basic question as well, but I think basic questions are actually quite nice. What is the difference between fisheries and agriculture? And agriculture? Aquaculture. Aquaculture. Aqua. Cool. Yeah, so uh, very, very, uh, very defined and distinct difference there. So aquaculture, you can just think of it as farming, essentially. So wild, wild catch fisheries is all going to be caught uh, essentially wild. So nothing has been given to the fish, nothing's been fed to them. That people are going out either on boats or if they're in a river, they're in a river. But those fish are existing entirely on their own accord. They're eating what they want to eat and they're living where they want to live. And then they are essentially caught. Um, it's still called production. So you can produce fish through wild catch and you can produce fish through aquaculture. But in the wild instance or just general fisheries, that will that will generally mean the ocean or wild wild oceans or wild water spaces. But uh, aquaculture is just farming essentially. It's just a uh, it's essentially the uh, marine version of agriculture. So it just means you are actually having some input, you are growing some sort of species, um, whether that's plant-based or, or an animal. Um, it's just farming, farming in the water, basically. Okay, that's a, that's a very clear answer, thank you. Um, we talked about the impressive innovations previously, uh, but there's also then a question on the role of technology um, and whether technology is the answer to try and make you know, seafood production ever more sustainable or whether actually we shouldn't be rather tackling, you know, demand as opposed to only looking at supply. What would you say to that? I think there's, uh, at least from what I've read and the people that I've spoken to, I would say my personal opinion on this is it kind of has to come from both ends. I don't think it can come from one side. Um, I don't think it can just come from innovators to try and solve the problems. I don't think technology is always necessarily the answer. And some of the best answers are actually really simple answers, which is something that we uh, we explore in the course as well, is like a lot of these, as I said with the potato, it's not always the, the sexiest solutions, but they're, they are really effective. And some of them are as simple um, as, you know, in, in, the, in the instance of aquaculture, so farm, if you take a farm of salmon, uh, one of the kind of most recent developments, I guess you could call it an innovation, is that fish welfare drastically improves if you reduce um, the stocking density. So you have less fish uh, rather than more fish jammed into these net pens. You're going to have uh, much healthier fish. In every instance, they're going to get less parasites in there. They're going to be far healthier, probably have um, quicker growing rates as well. And this is not sort of rocket science. This is pretty simple stuff that you probably could have assumed, but these to me are kind of 
these are sort of some interesting innovations that are that are also kind of coming from consumers in a way that people uh, are becoming more exposed to the issues. I think there are a lot of documentaries produced now and people are kind of aware that these things can be managed badly. Um, and because of that, some people are trying some different things to, to try and kind of keep up. And, um, and you're kind of ending up with this sort of cross, this kind of crossroads of innovators helping people to kind of operate with like lower densities, but also it's coming from the consumers as well who want better fish welfare because they feel like there's uh, obviously some ethical concerns. So yeah, I think it's a happy, a happy, a happy medium probably. Because as a, as a consumer, we're obviously forced to compare options. I mean, pricing is obviously a, a very important factor that will drive choice. But when we're talking about sustainability, there's always this comparative assessment that, that one has to make. And I would imagine in fisheries, in aquaculture, you will get the comparative assessment within the sphere of seafood production. But then there's also the question of the comparative assessment between seafood production and other types of uh, food production. Um, does the course also address some of that? Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, we do focus primarily, I would say, on seafood itself. We don't draw too much comparison to land-based, but uh, it's it's a very valid discussion to be having, I think. Um, I think particularly in the last kind of few decades as aquaculture has gained a lot of attention. Um, and in, and it's it's actually, it's sort of gained a lot of heat. I think it's got a lot of negative attention um, for a lot of, I think for a lot of good reasons, but also some of those are not potentially justified. But making the comparison then of how aquaculture is kind of growing in this last say uh, two decades versus how agriculture and land has expanded and how we use the land, I think there are some interesting comparisons to be made. And we do make those comparisons um, uh, in some ways or others in the course. And they are, yeah, I think they're I think they're worthwhile to give you some perspective on when we're talking about growing an entire industry that is is sort of one that feeds you know a third of the world. I think you have to look at how we have been doing things and and um, we haven't been doing things fantastically on land and how can we avoid making those same mistakes as we expand that kind of same intensified approach but in the ocean. I think it's an important discussion for sure. And an intensified uh, seafood production also then chimes in with something that we hear uh, in terms of fishing quotas, right? So there are, there are quotas on the amount of fish you can, you can fish. How do those exactly work? Are they, are they actually helping to preserve and manage the, the, the population of, of fish in the seas and ocean? And, you know, what is the role of quotas actually in the overall picture of, you know, getting to a more sustainable seafood production? That's a really great question. Um, and it's one we have a full article on in the course. <laughs> so if you would like to, if you'd like to go deep on that, I would, I would very much recommend the course because we do explain all that. It is, it is quite a, uh, quite a tricky topic and quite hard to get your head around. There's a lot of policy involved. Um, so if you want to go deep on it, definitely go into the course and have a read. Um, but the long and the, sh the kind of sh the short of it is, uh, Quotas are a very helpful tool. I think they're a super helpful tool and they're one of the kind of key management tools that we have today. So uh, it is relating to wild stocks. So uh, we mentioned the wild catch versus aquaculture. This is, quotas are relating to wild fisheries, right? So things that exist kind of out of our human control here. And essentially all it is, is a, an imposed limit on how much can be caught. Uh, either that's a limit on uh, a species or it might even be on an area or a time of year that you're allowed to fish for a certain um, species or even it might be size limits but quotas in general um, are going to be how much you can catch or how much say one country is allowed to catch in a certain area for a certain year or a certain period of time and then they can be kind of divided it, it gets quite complicated but uh if you want to go if you want to go deep in it yeah go for the course, but it's a, it's a very effective management tool and one that is, is widely used all around the world in the European Union specifically is, um, is very much, uh, very much using that through almost all of its fisheries, I believe. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, there's a, another, another point here on, is there some health risks associated to fish farming? Uh, and, and maybe also to, to build on that, uh, the environment for fish is changing. 
Um, do we see also any potential health effects from a changing environment on, on fish and therefore also then our, our consumption of seafood? Are there elements that we need to be aware of or careful of? Is that actually also addressed in the course or is that a, a different kind of topic? It's another great question and it is also addressed in the course. It's a, it's a dense little course. Um, there's quite a lot in there, but we do, we do actually cover exactly that. So climate change is one of those things that is having a huge effect. I mean, there are a number of things that are having a huge effect, human induced and also climate change, two of the kind of key factors, of course. But yeah, it's, it's, it certainly is changing environments and it's, it's definitely, it's definitely having an impact on marine ecosystems. I think we're only kind of just understanding. And I'm not an absolute expert on this, so this is just uh, my perspective. But um, yeah, it's definitely having an effect on on certain species. Um, whether that has a, a a negative health side effect on us, I think the the science is sort of unclear there in the in the aquaculture space, I think there is a little bit more science just because I think it's more um, more studied and it's easy to control the variables there so you can understand what's really happening. There have definitely been instances where certain seafood products that are produced in farms have had negative side effects for sure. Um, if they've been sort of pumped full of antibiotics in an uncontrolled manner, uh, a lot of the aquaculture that used to occur in Southeast Asia and, some, and, and still does to this day actually, uh, had a very loose kind of control on things like the antibiotics that they were feeding um, either their prawns or their or their shrimp or their uh, or their fish and that could have potentially some side effects if you consume a lot but in uh, in Europe at least the it's the it's very very unlikely that there's going to be negative health side effects um, it's all very tightly controlled there are a ton of regulations um, to the point that it makes it very hard, I think, to set up a farm. <laughs> I think you really have to, you have to pass a lot of hurdles and a lot of checkpoints before you're able to reach a market. So I, uh, even for shellfish, that is, they have to go through a testing phase. So yeah, yeah, I think over here, you're pretty, you're pretty fine, but it is, um, it is a consideration and with, yeah, with, with conditions changing, it's certainly something that's um, a, a talking point. And I think innovators are starting to kind of work around that space and provide some solutions now. Okay, brilliant. This is very uh, dense and intense. So thanks a lot, Oliver, for you know taking us through uh, all these answers to the many questions that are coming in, and also thanks to the audience for for being interactive. This is the point, you know. We obviously a lot of things are being addressed in the course, so you're just getting a, a top line view on on some of these questions. So do look further at the information. Uh, but Oliver is giving a sense of of what is out there, um, and I have one last question, which is quite Euro, Euro specific, uh, very policy specific. Um, but I just thought maybe you can have an attempt at it. It is actually quite interesting. It's almost geopolitical to some extent. So how important has sustainability been in the post Brexit fisheries management negotiations? And as you're based in Norway as well, between the UK, the EU and Norway, how has that affected that relationship? And do you think that with the UK becoming uh, an autonomous maritime entity again this has had an effect on sustainability yeah that's a whole uh, that's a phd that one but i think um i'll give i'll give my two cents i think there's i think it's definitely impacted uh some geopolitics for sure without a doubt and i think we've seen that in a number of instances there's been some kind of backs and forth between those countries deciding uh who gets to fish in which areas because they did before that share certain areas and they did share the certain uh, fish stocks. Wild fish can obviously travel wherever they like to travel. So these kind of imaginary boundaries that we draw in the ocean saying one country can fish here and one can fish here are sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're all hypothetical. If a fish swims into the other side, then um, uh, it's, it's on that, it's in that territory and it can be fished by a different country. But if, if we're managing, say, a certain stock, which is how we tr we tend to manage sustainability today, is by managing one stock. So if we're managing, say, one stock of mackerel or herring, um, and you're you're fishing on based on a quota that is uh, set on a sustainability limit, um, then yes, it becomes a lot more it becomes a lot more difficult. I think if you have two countries who have to decide um, how they kind of split that stock and 
you know, you, you're kind of factoring it. It's just the factoring in a lot more, I think, when you're talking about sustainability for a particular stock that has to be shared. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a great question, but it's one that I probably can't give a totally clear answer on. I'm, I'm sure there's someone out there that can, that can do this, but Google might be a best friend, I think, for this. No, I, I, I imagine, and it's uh, you know these are these are open discussions, they're ongoing discussions as well. So um, I just thought it was it was interesting to also bring it back into a, a geopolitical context. It also comes back to the policy notion around fishing quotas. So there are there are big frameworks that also um, ensure that you know certain fish fish are, are, are preserved, others are able to be to be fished, and, and different countries have access to different stocks. So this all has a big impact. Um, thank you so much uh, to all of you for your active engagement. Thanks a lot to, to Oliver for all these great answers. We did, I think, our best to answer as many as we could. Um, you can actually let us know in the Slido poll uh, if you think you might want to sign up for this course. That would actually be really interesting for us to know. How likely is it that you would sign up to this online course having followed now this, this discussion and some of the answers that have been given to, to, to the many questions that you raise? So please let us know. And before we close, I would like to just come back to Oliver and just take a little bit of time to reflect more specifically on learning and the importance of learning. Uh, because we, we've talked a lot about, about seafood, but we're also talking about an online course. Um, so first of all, I, I wonder if you could maybe share with us um, in your learning uh, journey a, a personal anecdote of, of something that, uh, that you learned that was interesting, that was original, that maybe, I don't know, maybe changed your life. And maybe that's a bit uh, you know, exaggerated, but something <laughs> along those lines. Yeah, plenty. Uh, still learning every single day, but um, yeah, it's a that's a that's a good uh, it's a great question, and I, I don't know if I could pinpoint one specific moment when something's kind of changed my life, but it's for me it's kind of been a thousand cuts. I think I've, there's one clear line I think that I've I've really picked up in the past um, few years of meeting with people. I think from all walks of life. Uh, obviously I'm working in sort of the food space but also in the seafood space uh, and it's just that everyone has different perspectives I think you know you don't you don't really know what you don't know I think is a really important line that I've picked up and I've kind of carried along with me uh, and I think a lot of us sort of see our our truth or the thing that we think is truth uh, only because of what we don't really know or these other perspectives that we haven't really taken on board yet which I think is great um, it creates these perspectives and I think we kind of need that um, but I've seen that a lot of these sort of inefficiencies or breakdowns um, in our supply chains and especially in food systems I think come generally from people like not putting in the time and the energy to understand why other people might think the way that they do or why they might act the way that they do um, essentially just closing themselves off to not accepting another person's version of the truth based on their own perspective and I know it sounds very kind of philosophical but I think it really applies in the learning sense because we've ended up with these sort of divisions you know with with people not being willing to open up between you know us as consumers and like the producers who make our food or the producers and the retailers or even the retailers and the policy makers that uh, uh, and even the scientists that advise them I think a lot of these are kind of partially responsible for the poor state of of our food systems and fisheries um, and I've seen that with a lot of people I've talked to. And I think that can be solved. I'm honestly just through learning and taking the time to understand why people act the way that they do. Um, and more often than not, I've seen that most of us have the same kind of broad goals, I think. So people, regardless of our job, I think we, we all sort of, if you ask people, would want the world to be kind of more sustainable, the fisheries sector in this instance, to be more sustainable and be more equitable, I think, for everyone in it. But we all have our totally unique way of looking at it. So the fishermen have their own unique way of looking at it and policy makers have their own way of looking at it. So for me, it's just been about taking a step back, I think, from my own sort of version of the truth and trying to open up and listen and, uh, and learn as much as I possibly can. And I think um, taking any course like this or any of the other ones on Future Learn is kind of a perfect step towards, uh, to, towards opening yourself up and trying to take on a new perspective, which is super valuable. I think super valuable.
Oh, it's, um, I like that. It's like learning builds empathy. Something like that. I, I could almost uh, try and summarize if I may, but I, uh, yeah, I, I, I like that point. Um, last one, Oliver, before I let you go, um, what piece of advice would you like to give to someone who is considering a learning course? Someone who's considering a learning course, uh, I would say absolutely just do one. I mean, I think uh, I partially kind of went into that a little bit in the last question, maybe I'm, I'm overlapping a bit, but to, to yeah, just to expand yourself, I guess, and to, to gain perspective, I think is the best reason to do it. Um, I think we've all sort of, at least that I certainly did when I was, uh, when I was younger, you, you see these sort of David Attenborough documentaries and they instantly change the way that you see the world. You know, in my situation, we, I, see one about the uh, about the ocean and I'd look out at the ocean and I would imagine what was beneath it but you kind of don't know that until you until something is presented to you so that you can start thinking in a different way and I think to me like this course or any course really it's a pretty similar experience whether it's a yeah an online course or or carpentry if you want to take a carpentry course I think they're all they just kind of shift the way that you start that you start looking at the world um, and they're not super intensive these online courses uh, either. I think they're pretty, they're pretty kind of digestible, and um, you're obviously not going to have anyone sort of breathing down your neck, forcing you to finish. Um, it's kind of up to you, and that's the beauty of it. You can kind of work it around your life and slot it in any time, uh, whenever and wherever it works for you. So I think, yeah, absolutely. Just if you've got the capacity to do it and you're interested, I think you should just go for one for sure. Okay, brilliant. Oliver, thank you so much uh, for having taken the time to, to share all these insights into the course. Also, some of your insights more generally uh, on, on seafood production and sustainability in, uh, in, in the seafood production sphere. So, thanks a lot, Oliver. I hope that was interesting for all of you, that you got a good sense of the, of the course and what's, uh, what's coming for you if you choose to take it. And I'd like to uh, have a look maybe at the poll and see if people are actually likely to sign up to the online course, having now listened uh, to, to Oliver and, and, and his many, many answers to the questions. Can we have a, a quick look at the results of the poll just to see if we are on a good track? But it looks like, yes, we have a score of 9.4 uh, with a lot of people uh, thinking that they might want to sign up. So please do. Thank you so much to all of you for having joined. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, you will have now plenty of time uh, to go through the event platform, uh, have a look at the expo area. There are many different pieces of information there. You will be able to learn more about what's in the course, more about the offering of EIT food in terms of online learning. So please uh, take your time. Uh, any answers will be given after this uh, event anyway, so do also write in your questions. Also in the booth, you will see there are Q&A tabs there that you'll be able to engage with. And we will make sure that we come back to you with all the answers. And we look forward to having you join the online course at EIT Food. Thank you so much and see you next time. Bye-bye.